This three-part painting by Max Beckman is called Departure, begun in May 1932 and completed in December of the following year. It was the first of ten triptychs that he painted between 1932 and his death in 1950. The imagery is crowded and obscure. A clear theme is not immediately evident, although the complicated three-part design suggests there might be some level of narrative meaning. In 1937, Beckman is reported to have the following way. Life is what you see right and left. Life physical and mental. Men and women are subjected to it equally. Here you see yourself as you try to find your way in the dark. You illumine the hall and stairs with a miserable lamp and you drag along, tied to you as part of yourself, the corpse of your memories, mistakes and defeats, the murder everybody commits once in his life. You can never rid yourself of your past. You must carry the corpse along and life beats the drum. The king and queen, man and woman, are taken to another shore by a boatman whom they do not know. He wears a mask. It is a mysterious figure taking us to a mysterious land. The king and queen have freed themselves of the tortures of life. They have overcome them. The queen carries the greatest treasure, freedom, as her child in her lap. Freedom is the one thing that matters. It is the departure, the new start. Four years after finishing the picture, Beckman interprets it in terms of vague, generalized abstractions. He leads us through a series of symbolic images, apparently dissociated from contemporary life. The following year, he wrote, I have never had anything to do with politics. I take it for granted that there are two separate worlds, that of the spirit and that of political reality. They may impinge on each other from time to time, but they are essentially different. Beckman's retrospective statements and explanations invite an ahistorical reading of his works. They have encouraged many art historians to see works like Departure as enigmatic, as a highly subjective vision defying any clear interpretation. In which case, it's been argued, Rather than try to make sense of the images, we should just experience the bewildering total visual effect. I want to examine the problems of how we do try and read such a work. Should we see it simply as a confusion of bizarre private images? Or is there a more public level of meaning? What could it have meant to a contemporary audience? Beckman uses a figurative style. Forms are recognisable, but what they symbolise, or their relationship to each other, is not. There is a large fish in the hands of the masked figure. And there are fish in the king's net. In the right panel, the messenger boy holds another large fish. And in the left panel, a fish forms part of the bludgeon. What significance could these repeated images have? Beckman uses a similar figurative style and odd juxtaposition of images in The Temptation, his second triptych. Once again, we find striking images of imprisonment and bondage, although in Temptation, these images are in all three panels. He was working on it in Berlin in 1936 and 1937, at the same time that he offered Lili von Schnitzler his explanation of departure. A comparison of these two triptychs, temptation and departure, raises some important issues. Were they designed to be read in similar ways, or would one have been more readable than the other? These paintings weren't produced in a cultural, political or social vacuum, both the conventions and symbolic references used must have had some contemporary meanings. 
1932, the year that Beckman began work on the departure, there was a bloody election campaign. On the 30th of January, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor and head of a coalition government. In February, the National Socialists accused the Communists of setting fire to the Reichstag building. Hitler, now Chancellor, has announced that the fire was the work of Communists and was intended to be the signal for a Bolshevist uprising throughout the country. In consequence, Germany has been placed under a system of martial law, a decree having been signed which aims at the total destruction of Communism. Over the next two years, Hitler attempted to bring all aspects of German culture under government control. In Munich, in 1933, he laid the cornerstone of the House of German Art, a new building to house officially approved works, supposedly reflecting the true historical principles of German art. The introduction, that same year, of National Socialist policies to reorganize the German art world forced Beckman to make his own departure. He resigned his professorship at the Frankfurt School of Art and moved to Berlin. On one level, the theme of this painting, Departure, can be seen as a direct reference to events which accompanied the rise of National Socialism and to the forced departure of many artists and intellectuals from previously held posts and activities. Both side panels show scenes of torture included, perhaps, as a reference to the activities of Hitler's stormtroopers in the early 30s. But Beckman had already used similar images in earlier works. This suggests that some images also had a particular private significance. However, the possibility that Beckman did intend departure to be an explicit comment on the current German political situation is increased by a comparison with Knight, an even earlier work from 1918 or 19. In this picture, Beckman represented explicit scenes of social chaos and destruction. These were seen at the time as a reference to the social and political upheavals of the early Weimar Republic. But we can't prove that departure was intended either as an overt attack on National Socialism or as a more general comment on a violent political situation. It would have been far too risky for Beckman to explain publicly such levels of meaning and remain in Germany. Working during the rise of National Socialism may have encouraged him to exploit the possibilities of imagery which lends itself to a variety of interpretations. In an attempt to prevent the Nazi authorities from reading political meanings into departure, he attached labels with Shakespearean titles to the backs of each panel. There are other compatible readings of departure. Beckman's early interest in primitive religions and myths, especially Greek and Christian, is reflected in the dress of the figures in the central panel. The idea for this group may have been suggested to him by the Greek myth of Acheron, who ferried dead souls across the river Styx. And in early Christian mythology, the fish, a secret sign for Christ in Greek, was also believed to have magical powers. In a similar vein, the figure of the bellhop or messenger boy could be read as a modern Hermes, the classical messenger of fate. But it's difficult to establish any consistent mythological interpretation of this painting. If the content is ambiguous, perhaps we can understand more by looking at the artistic traditions the picture was part of. By the time Beckman started work on the departure, he was a well-established painter with a large international following. Already in his 40s, his work had been widely exhibited in Germany and Europe. His detailed figurative style had established him as an important member of the Neue Sachlichkeit, or New Objectivity Movement, of the 20s. Many of the German artists connected with Neue Sachlichkeit, including Otto Dix and George Gross, also adopted a figurative or so-called realist style, 
in order to make specific social or political points through their work. So in his 1926 painting, Pillars of Society, Gross used caricatured but readable images of the church, the military, and the bourgeoisie to attack the widespread corruption in contemporary German society. In the early 30s, National Socialist propaganda grouped Beckmann's work with that of expressionist artists such as Kandinsky and the Blauer Reiter group, labelling them all degenerate. In 1937, Hitler attacked the work of modern German artists in a speech given at the opening of the exhibition of degenerate art in Munich. I mean to forbid these pitiable unfortunates who clearly suffer from visual disorders from attempting to force the results of their defective vision onto their fellow human beings as reality or indeed from serving it up as art. The exhibition was selected and organized to ridicule a wide range of work by modern German artists. It included examples by Beckmann, Gross, Dix, Kirchner and Nolder. Paintings were surrounded by insulting slogans and the catalogue reproductions of some exhibits were printed alongside photographs of works by the supposedly mentally ill. This portrait sculpture by Hoffmann was illustrated next to a similar work by the inmate of a psychiatric clinic. The label degenerate art seems to have been applied to most aspects of modern German art which had been popular before 1933 especially if the artist was thought to have associated with, or sympathised with, left-wing politics. What art forms then constituted the politically acceptable National Socialist art? So übergebe ich denn damit dieses stolze und herrliche Haus seiner Bestimmung. They included those works exhibited in the inaugural exhibition of the House of German Art. As the historian Berthold Hintz has argued, German fascism couldn't create a new, approved form of art out of nothing. Just as the development of National Socialism was rooted in German history, so the artistic conventions it adopted already existed in German art. They were well rooted in those conventions which we have now come to see as anti-modernist. The detailed, realistic styles continued after the First World War by more traditional German artists, were considered more suitable for the representation of such favoured national socialist themes as the Aryan ideal, the German peasant family, or selected episodes from German history. Through its art, national socialist ideology sought to construct a specific German cultural identity. Germany celebrates her international exhibition of culture with a mile-long procession in which each of the floats represents one of the arts or sciences. This, I suppose, is music and this sculpture. They're all very artistic, very beautiful and very imposing, but it's rather hard to know what they represent. So I leave it to you. You can have three guesses. References to Gothic and Renaissance culture and historical allegories reinforced a concept of German unity and militarism. The triptych form was widely adopted for its historical pseudo-religious significance and for its propagandist function. It was highly suitable for the public representation of narrative and moralizing themes. Beckmann like several other Neuzachlichkeit artists, had already revived the triptych format for related reasons. A comparison of departure with Wilhelm Peterson's triptych The Family underlined the ideological differences between the two. Peterson idealizes the historic German family, using a Madonna and child grouping in the central panel to give the work a quasi-religious status and authority. Beckman also uses a family group in the central panel. But both the title and the contrasting images in the side panels strongly suggest a departure, 
a departure from social and political chaos. In this respect, this work could be seen to subvert the traditional religious associations of the triptych form exploited by National Socialism. But Beckmann's use of the triptych may also have been influenced by the new German theatre movement in the 20s and 30s. Left-wing productions by the director Owen Piscator, some with set designs by George Gross, made use of a three-part triptych-like division of the stage. These designs were for the 1927-28 production of The Good Soldier Schweik. Three different pieces of action were acted out simultaneously, contrasting with or commenting on each other. It's likely that Beckman was familiar with these dramatic techniques. He had a strong interest in contemporary drama and wrote two plays himself. The disruption of a traditional linear narrative is echoed in the composition of the triptychs. In Departure, Beckman exploits a series of contrasts between the central and the side panels. And in the right panel, a drama separates the spectators from the scene on the raised stage-like area. Other paintings from the 20s and 30s, and from later in his career, depict performers such as clowns, actors and musicians. Often they are self-portraits, as in this of Beckman blowing his own trumpet in 1938. It was these interests that prompted his friend Stephen Lackner to describe Beckman's work as a stage presentation divided into acts. In an account called Max Beckman's Mystical Pageant of the World. We've seen that on one level, departure could be read as a work referring to political events. But can a similar reading be applied to The Temptation, completed shortly before Beckman left Berlin for Amsterdam? The Degenerate Art Exhibition had opened in the summer of that year, and working under such conditions may have encouraged Beckman to represent an even more ambiguous set of images than those in The Departure. The repeated image of imprisonment or bondage may have been intended as a further reference to political and cultural restrictions in Nazi Germany. But attempts have also been made to provide more specific political readings. Charles Kessler has suggested the bellhop, hair plastered down over his left brow, represents Hitler. that the figure on the ground signifies the Jews of Nazi Germany, and that the crisscross patterns of their legs and arms represent a swastika. An initial understanding of temptation actually demands a whole body of literary and mythological knowledge. We know from the full title, Temptation of St. Anthony, that it's based on a story by Flaubert, although allusions to Flaubert's work are intermingled with other sources of imagery. A more personal or private function of this work is suggested by the image of the artist in the central panel. He is being tempted by his model, the semi-clothed woman on the right. The artist's feet and hands are bound to help him resist temptation. Parallels have been drawn here between Beckman's imagery and Flaubert's account of St. Antony's vision of the dying gods of paganism. According to Flaubert, the fertility goddess Diana of Ephesus squeezes her many breasts and finds them all empty. Apart from this explicit reference to Flaubert's story, the image suggests a self-conscious concern with the artist's role. Saint and artist are linked, and the painter is given a pseudo-religious status as the central image of the triptych. The left-hand panel relates less clearly to Flaubert's work, and more, apparently, to Greek mythology. Having slain a many-eyed monster, the warrior, Perseus, perhaps, looks set to rescue a woman, Andromeda. She is chained to a spear in a position which may symbolize rape. The huge figure of a moor holding an oar looms in the background. In the right-hand panel, the caged woman may be the Queen of Sheba from Flaubert's Temptation. 
and the huge bird, a magic Persian bird, the Sinorganka. These literary figures are juxtaposed with one of Beckman's recurring images, the bellhop. The letters on his cap indicate that he is an employee of the Kempinski, a well-known Berlin restaurant. This modern messenger carries a crown and leads yet another degraded woman like a dog. To the right, between us and the characters, is a silhouette, often thought to be Beckman himself. Temptation's confusing array of possible literary, mythological, and even contemporary references make it a less accessible and, therefore, less public painting than Departure. However, in 1938, six of Beckman's works, including The Temptation, were shown in an exhibition in London, organized as a retort to Hitler's degenerate art exhibition of the preceding year. In this context, Beckman's triptych was seen by reviewers as a fundamental statement of German expressionism, as a violent, even romantic piece of self-expression. This view was reinforced by On My Painting, the lecture he gave to accompany the exhibition. It served to confuse any attempts to understand the temptation in terms of contemporary social and artistic developments, or even specific historical or mythological themes. Instead, it contained a lot of pseudo-philosophical speculation about the nature of the artist's activity and his role in life. Beckman argued that the formal content of his works, the lines, colors, and forms, were somehow the vehicles of a deeper reality. Naturally, as a painter, I take delight in color as the mysterious, sublime expression of a spectrum of the eternal. It too enriches the composition and enables me to penetrate the object more deeply. It has its part in determining my spiritual attitude to the works, but in this it is subordinate to light and especially to the treatment of form. In some respects, this is a typical example of modernist writing about art. It exalts the artist as a spiritually endowed individual, communicating deeper meanings through his art. It reinforces the view Beckman expressed in an earlier letter to Kurt Valentin. I can only speak to people who, consciously or unconsciously, carry within them a similar metaphysical code. The imagery of temptation, then, may represent Beckman's continuing attempt to find a visual form for the mystical role he accords art and the artist. Such views are rooted in the German idealist philosophical tradition, which influenced much of early expressionist theory. And the view that both triptychs are part of Beckmann's mystical and therefore impenetrable pageant of the world is itself a product of such theories. Beckmann then had become increasingly preoccupied in the late 30s with his own role and status as an artist with the notion that artistic activity was somehow separate from social and political reality. His later comments have helped both to mystify and to obscure the important differences between the departure and the temptation. <laughs> 